Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity today to come and to serve you, to share your word, to feel your presence, to be with my brothers and sisters who are here. What a privilege, what an awesome privilege. So God, I thank you, Father, for all that you are, all that you do in our lives, and Lord, those things in which I believe you're going to do in our lives. I'm just so grateful. And I'm humbled by the fact that you would choose somebody like me to share your word publicly. It's an awesome, awesome responsibility. And I pray that I never take it lightly. So God, lead this your servant. Help me to say the things you want me to say. Help me to refrain from the things you want me to refrain. May your anointing be upon this service. In Jesus' name, amen. So I wrote this little thing on Facebook, and I'm not going to say it word for word because I can't even memorize my own stuff. <laughs> Isn't that awful? You ever say something, and then somebody goes, can you repeat that? And you're like, oh, I don't know if I can. I'll try. So anyways, I was on Facebook this morning, and, and uh, you know, I've been thinking about journeys. You know, we watch the journey of Abraham, and uh, we see that he leaves Haran, and he goes to Canaan, and he journeys all over the place, even into Egypt during a famine. And uh, some of his journey was a little sketchy, right? Some of the things that he did along the journey was a little sketchy, I should say. Right? Little things, something that we wouldn't think that Abraham, the father of the faith, right? The father of the people of Israel, so to speak, would do those things. But, you know, <laughs> he was human. And then we see Isaac, not a lot said about Isaac, but doesn't go very far. We don't see a lot of journeying with Isaac too much, except during a famine. And he does the same thing his papa did. He calls his wife his sister. But he got caught this time before his wife went to be part of the harem. And now we're talking about Jacob, the third in line, who not only had an interesting life at home, right? He was a little deceiver. And he was good at deceiving. He is what I would call in our modern language an opportunist to the furthest degree. Do you remember his opportunist example? Do you remember his brother comes home famished? I want some of that stuff. And Jacob being that kindly, wonderful little brother said, hey, absolutely, I see that you're starving. I don't want to see my brother starve. No, of course not. That's not what he said. He's like, you know what? You're that hungry? Sell me your birthright. And crazy Esau did. Time passes. Papa's getting old. He wants to bless Esau, his firstborn. And that type of blessing back then was like a, a will, an inheritance, if you will, of what you were passing on to your son, your oldest son. And so Esau is all excited. He's like, he's going to get the goods. He's going to be the head of the family, secured. And that has to do also with their finances and all that kind of stuff. And so what does he do? He gets to in front of uh, Isaac, and, he, and Isaac says, go hunt game for me, that you may bless me, that I may bless you. And he's like, oh, this is great. I'll go hunt. And he was good at it. And so he went out hunting. Well, while he went out hunting, not only was Jacob a deceiver, but come to find out, Rebecca's side of the family has a little trouble with deception. Mama says, honey, come on over. Let me fix you up. You go in and place your brother. Oh, but wait, I'm, I'm kind of a smooth guy. I'm not hairy. That's okay. We have plenty of goats. I'll stick hair all over your body that needs to be so your dad doesn't know. And he does. They pull it off. Esau comes back. And he is not a happy camper. Not only did he lose his birthright over a bucket of stew or a, a plate of stew, but he also lost his blessings of an inheritance that his papa was supposed to give him according to the tradition back then. He didn't get it. And so Jacob is told by his mama, you know, your brother is so mad that he wants to kill you. So think about Rebecca. I mean, think about the motherliness inside of you ladies, whether you're a mom or not. Think of the motherliness thing. Your child wants to kill your other child because of something that you did. 
I'm thinking you would, as a mom, make a declarative thing. Hey, it was my fault, honey. Esau, it was my fault. I'm the one that put him up to this. I'm the one that stuck the goat's hair all over him. I'm the one. No, what does she do? Honey, you need to go. You need to leave. Go find yourself a wife among my family members. So the deceiver that's been deceived with his mother and deceived by his mother, who deceived the family to get the inheritance, is told to go to the deceiver, Laban. What an interesting journey. Do you ever think of it like that? The deceiver was deceived and deceived, and he went to the deceiver's house from his old house, who was a deceiver mom, and then he goes and gets deceived, and then he deceives, and it's just a big bunch of deception. I mean, we could call this a soap opera. Right? I mean, and, 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 and hey, listen, soap opera? I mean, you can even add the fact that Jacob marries the wrong woman. Oh, my goodness. He had no idea. And then his dad, and, and the, could you imagine this? Even if you're not a dad, the dad type heart, can you imagine your oldest daughter and youngest daughter? And you're like, you know what? Hmm. Now, it doesn't say why Laban did what he did, but he says why he did what he did. But he's such a deceiver, I don't know if I can believe that he did that for that reason. But nonetheless, he goes and tricks Jacob, who doesn't love Leah, to marry Leah. What kind of a dad would do that? A deceiver. Laban. And then, you all know the story. I'm kind of bringing you up to where we are now. And Rachel is given to him after seven days. Could you imagine? You're just coming back from your honeymoon. It's not a honeymoon that's exciting. Because you're with the woman you didn't want. Could you imagine the honeymoon? It might have been more like bitter moon. I mean, I don't know. But he fulfilled his week with her, the Bible says. And then all of a sudden, guess what? He gets married all over again to Rachel seven days later. And then the fight begins. Hey, Leah's not loved. She's not appreciated. She's not cared for. She gives the man six children. She stops bearing. And then all of a sudden, she says, or, or Rachel is not bearing at all. And so she's got an idea. So she gives Bilhah, her servant, her, her, her lady that cares for her, uh, to her husband so that she can have children through her. And then Leah stops bearing, and she's like, hey, my sister had a great idea, so you know what, Zilpa will also uh, be a concubine, or, you know, marry my husband. And so at this point in the journey back where we're picking it up, Jacob has 12 children, but Benjamin isn't born yet. Because don't forget... There was a little girl in there. Her name was Dinah. Right? It's where the song came from. Who's in the kitchen with Dinah? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Jacob's family. <laughs> I just got a feeling I'm going to hear it from somebody afterwards. But So, Jacob's family and his size of moving from three days journey from Laban to his parents or his dad go back to Canaan is a huge retinue, a massive amount of things. Donkeys and sheep and goats and oh my goodness, camels and cows full of stuff. So let's pick it up, Genesis 32, 1 and 2. Now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place Mahanaim. In verse 2, when Jacob says, this is God's camp, it also can mean God's company. And Mahanaim, translated, means two camps. But here's the thing. Jacob is on his way home. And I want you to think about this for just a moment. How many of us could say that we have had a physical sighting? We heard the audible voice of God in our life as a Christian. I mean, you have seen something that was either an angel or Jesus himself, or you physically heard the audible word of God. How many of us could say that? Raise your hand. Very few. Very few. And my hand is raised. I've heard God's voice. Matter of fact, it wasn't pleasant. 
It was instructive. Changed my life right then and there. Some of us are like, I love when God talks to me. I just get the chills and the warms and the fuzzies. Usually when God talks to you, it's like, that's what I get. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I just get straightened up, boy. You're just doing the, I don't know. It's just, I, anyway. Genesis 32, verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Now again, let me go back. So he has these visitations. He has these dreams. He has this word. God speaks to him. He sees angels. He's seen what he calls the ladder, the throne of God. Calls that place Bethel, the place where God is. I mean, this guy has seen Jesus. He's seen God. He's seen angels. He's seen stuff that we may have never seen. And so he sees God again, and he just he calls the place Mahanam. This, God's got two camps here. I don't know what he saw. It must have been a spectacular sight, but that's all the Scripture says about it. But it's massive. It's awesome. So Jacob sends messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now question do you think jacob is calling esau lord as a place of respect because he is now humble or because of his fear of his brother because i don't care how much time goes by if you haven't made things right with the one that wants to kill you it kind of stays right here in the back of your mind and he's been told by god to go home so now because of his deceptive ways He's trying to figure it out. Let me tell you something that is really important, and I'm telling you this by example. See, there's another word that we use in our culture for deceiver. We use the word hustler. We can hustle, can't we? I know I can. Now, do you know that sometimes a deceiver slash hustler It takes a little while for God to take that away from him. And every time that he comes into a place where it's getting uncomfortable, he's coming to a place where he's not sure about God, he begins to hustle some more because that's his nature that he's being cleansed from. The problem with that is when you hustle and God's gotten a hold of your life, it's going to cost you. We're going to see that in a few minutes. See, what God doesn't want in his children is that deceptive spirit or that hustling spirit. And oh, is that hard to break. Why? Because we're always trying to fix it. We're always trying to make it right. And it's always got to be to our advantage. That's what a hustler is. I'm going to fix it. It's going to be to my advantage. Jacob didn't want to get killed. Would you? (laughs) Right? Now, he's still telling his servant to say this to Esau. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Before Jacob left again, Isaac was set to bless Esau. Jacob deceived Isaac and stole the blessing. Genesis 27, 35, if you don't remember. And he said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. This is Isaac speaking to Esau. Because of that, Esau was going to kill Jacob after Isaac died. Again, Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. That was the last thing that was told to Jacob concerning Esau. See, Esau is also kind of a deceiver, isn't he? He's waiting for his dad to die. Then he's going to kill his brother. Isn't that interesting? The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and furthermore, he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. All right. Just knowing the story a little bit. How would you have received that warm, encouraging word? Because do you remember what Esau, or what Jacob told his servants to tell Esau? I got stuff. I got people. I am blessed. And all of a sudden, now Jacob's coming with 400 men. I don't know about you 
or Esau, thank you. Esau is coming with 400 men. I don't know about you, but that's a little overkill. Right? I mean, why would he take 400 guys? I don't know. Interesting, but what would go through your mind? So then Drake, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country, to your relatives, and I will prosper you. Listen to his prayer. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. At this point in Jacob's life, he is now 60 years old. He has four wives and 12 children, all under the age of 14 years old. I don't know what you think about when you read through this stuff, but when you think about time, and think about it, he's got camels and servants and animals and all this kind of stuff, plus he has a young family and he's 60. Now, I'm three years away from 60. I don't know about you, I would not want to have 12 with a 13th on the way, all under the age of 14. But nonetheless, that was it. Another interesting thing about Jacob is he didn't run. He didn't even hide. Why? Because as he's praying to the Lord, he's reminding the Lord the promise that he gave him He's listening to the Lord because the Lord told him to go back to his homeland. He was confident in the Lord even though he had no idea what his brother was going to do. Can I tell you, this is a great example of God transitioning someone into a man of God. You're not afraid anymore of people. And even if you are, you're still going forward because you know that's exactly what God wants you to do. Continuing in verse 12, chapter 32, For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. So he spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams. For those of you that may not know what a ewe is, it's a female lamb. So, in other words, a lot of stuff. So, 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. In other words, he is sending him as a gift a farm that's larger than most farms in New England. More rich than most farms in New England. That's what he's sending him as a gift. Isn't that interesting? What might that have looked like? 220 goats. I don't think I've ever seen 220 goats in one spot. 200 ewes and 20 rams. I don't think I've ever seen 220 sheep in one spot. Maybe I have, I don't know. 30 camels, and they're young. So we'll say about 60 camels, because 30 of them, they said, that they were milking, and they're young. So 60 camels, 30 donkeys. I almost wonder if the 30 donkeys were a joke, because you all know that um, when I was a kid, my mother used to say in French, tight the pioche. And what that means is like I got a head like a donkey. Donkeys are stubborn, right? That's, that's what she meant by that. She didn't mean that I literally look like a donkey. But I almost wonder if he sent all those donkeys because, you know, I don't know. But anyways, the Bible doesn't say what Jacob would have had left over after the gift. Think about this for a moment. You ever ask the question, why the gift? I did. Why would he send him a gift? To appease him? I almost wonder if he sent him the gift as an ask 
for forgiveness for deceiving him those two times. Because we're going to see in just a few moments, actually, we'll see it next time, not today. When Esau meets with him, Esau didn't even want the gifts. Jacob doesn't take them back. He gives them to Esau like a peace offering. Hmm. Do we do that as Christians? Have we ever been deceptive? Do we give a peace offering as an act of forgiveness or wanting to be forgiven for our deception? Hmm. Verse 16, he delivered them into the hands of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between droves. He commanded the one in front, saying, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going and to whom do these animals in front of you belong, then you shall say, these belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. Then he commanded also the second and the third and all those who followed the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on before him while he himself spent that night in the camp. Now before I go on. What he was looking for was forgiveness from his brother. He wasn't necessarily looking for his brother not to kill him, although I'm sure that was part of his thought as well. But he was looking for forgiveness from his brother. See, here's the thing that I will never discount even if I don't see it. See, we're all on a journey in life. And sometimes the old self wants to rise up and be the old self, right? Have you ever had that experience? Or am I alone? Our old self wants to rise up and take control over the things that God has cleansed and set free. And so there are times sometimes where we start walking in that. But I will never discount the work of the Holy Spirit and his activity in someone's life because I think that Jacob here, even before he wrestled with the angels, which we'll see, had a changed life. Sometimes I think we reject the process of change because quite possibly in our own mind we think everybody should be at the same place I am with Jesus and generally that usually happens with those of us that are not involved with somebody's life but we stand behind and pass judgment of what we see and not necessarily what we know Why do you think it's so important for people to be involved in other people's lives in the church of God where we disciple? They can help us along in our journey. We can help them along in in their journey. We can know them enough that if we see something, we can lovingly, lightly speak to them. They'll receive what we speak to them about. Why? Because we have a relationship with them. And that'll cause growth and not rejection. What ends up happening is, if we only see folks on Sundays, and we make that determination, and we go and confront somebody without a relationship, guess what that does to the person that's receiving your rebuke? I guess I'm going to go find another group of people to hang out with because I'm just not feeling the love. And they would be right in saying that if we're not involved in their life, discipling them already. Are you with me? Some of you may not agree. Turn it around. What if it's you? And I don't have a relationship with you. And I see something in your life that, man, I don't think is all that great. But I don't know you enough. I'm not your disciple. I'm not the one that's encouraging you. Generally, what I'll do is I'll be like, you know, I've noticed that you have been using a little foul language the last couple of weeks, and I'm really concerned about your walk with Jesus. Yeah, that's probably what, you know. Really? Because that's all I'm seeing. I'm not seeing what God's Holy Spirit is doing in this man's heart and life. We're getting to see some of that in some of the expression that Jacob is doing because we're seeing that he meets with God. God spoke to him in his prayer. 
See, that's another thing, too. If I'm not a discipler of somebody's life, I don't know what their prayer life is like. Now do I? I can't. This idea of church in the Western world, of us being separate from each other as opposed to loving with each other, discipling with each other, encouraging each other, having relationship with each other, I mean, we got to get to that place. If we want an on fire, Holy Spirit, healthy church, man, we've got to get to that place. Because in our culture, we're afraid of full disclosure, aren't we? But when we read the Bible, there's full disclosure. I mean, you just can't, you just can't help but see full disclosure in the Bible. But as Western Christians, you're at the right place right there. Right, right there. Yeah. That's as far as I can let you reach. That's good. Yeah. If that's the case, would we see this? Would we see Jacob's life unfolding if he didn't, if God didn't allow us to see it? See, if we have no relationship with Jacob, we're not going to see it like this. We're going to see him. Why'd you send all those animals over there, huh? Is that because you don't want to get killed? Is it all about self-preservation? You know what Jesus says. We need to die to ourselves, And if you need to die because of your deception, well, that's you. Rather than, hey, why'd you send that? I don't know. It was kind of hard on my brother. I deceived him twice. I want to do it as an appeasement, as a gift. Hmm. You all still love me? You don't have a choice. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now he arose that same night, took two of his wives and two and his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of Jacob. I guess uh, Dinah wasn't born then. He took them and sent them across the stream and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. All right, I don't know about you, but this is just, on the Western mind, this is just weird. He's all by himself, and here comes this man, and it's his man, and he decides, we're going to have ourselves an old-fashioned wrestling match right here and right now. I don't know how it came to be. I don't know if there were words between the two men. All I know is this is what it tells me. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. I don't know about you. Again, I'm 57 years old. I'm not in the shape that Jacob was in. I couldn't wrestle till daybreak. As a matter of fact, five minutes in, I'd be like, okay, okay, I gave up, I gave up, I'm done. Or I would have a heart attack because I couldn't breathe enough oxygen in to sustain my lungs to wrestle that long. But he wrestled until daybreak. And then my question is, is why would he do that? When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he, the angel, or the man, touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Some of our English language is just, you know... Maybe he did just go poof and it dislocated. All I can think of is they're wrestling. Bam! Dislocated his thigh. I don't know. But it had to have not felt good. Now the word touch doesn't necessarily mean touch, although it could have been he touched. I mean, it could have been like wrestling and a pow! Oh my goodness, I can't even, oh my goodness, my socket, it's all fun. I don't know. All I know is when I was a kid in the boys club, I wrestled. Real wrestling, not this stuff on TV where they're jumping off the you know, turnbuckles and uh, real wrestling. And let me tell you, you can, you can break bones if you're not in shape. You can hurt yourself really, really, or get hurt really, really bad if you're wrestling, real wrestling. And so if somebody smacks your, you know, your thigh, uh, you, you're going to know it. Then he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he, Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Okay. I'm in a wrestling match with someone. You think I'm going to say that to him? I'm going to be like, look, dude, you just knocked my socket out. I'm letting you go. You're pretty rugged. I can't breathe. I'm really sore. I'm hurt. I'm done. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said to him, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him <laughs> and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So in other words, 
Jacob must have known there was something unique about this man. I don't know how the wrestling match started, but he, they just started wrestling. Maybe the guy was muckling hold of Jacob. I don't know what this whole thing is, but he was wrestling. Here's the thing that I find interesting about this particular portion of Scripture, this interesting thing. Number one, I have to ask, why is it in there? Why is it in there? I mean, they could have zoomed past the wrestling match. They could have zoomed past the thigh being taken out of dislocation. They could have just went to this. What's your name? Jacob. No longer a Jacob. Israel. Does anybody know what Israel means? Israel means he who strives with God or to strive with God. And I'm going to stop here on my flipping through, but I want you to think about this for a moment. This wrestling match that's written out shows the tenacity that Jacob had to want to serve the Lord. It would be as if, to some degree, his tenacity to deceive and get his own way for his own stuff was being shed on his journeys. Now, when he gets to be with the Lord and he wrestles, maybe there was conversation that took place. I don't know. All I know is he wouldn't stop wrestling and he said, until you bless me. And when you look back at his prayer, he's not just talking about bless me alone. He was crying out in prayer for his wives and his children and God's promise in his life. Lord, you said that my family, we would be as the sand of his... Lord, you said, you told me to go back. Lord, the wives, the children, I'm concerned about what's going to happen to them. So when he is wrestling with this angel, I personally believe that he is doing more than just saying, bless me, the deceiver. He's saying, Lord, bless me. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Can I, can I just tell us that today, this illustration, for me, is where I think God would want us to be with him. Wrestling. We now call it in our westernized language, praying through. How many of us pray through? I mean, you pray. You pray and you pray even if it hurts. And you pray and you pray and you pray until you get God touching you, God talking to you, God ministering to you. And I got to wonder if in Jacob's life, he was a guy that prayed something like his actions in wrestling match prior to because of his time with God, because of the little picture of prayer that we saw that he gave. What I shared in Facebook this morning was this. When we are going on a journey here on, on earth, when we're on a journey, sometimes it can be long, sometimes it can be short. Sometimes, you know, when we're looking at a long journey, like, you know, we went to Colorado Springs this last summer, and so we mapped out all kinds of stuff about where we were going to sleep and the road we were going to take and all this kinds of stuff. We even prepared for tolls. We, we prepared for everything, as much as we could prepare for. But you ever notice that sometimes you might forget just a little something on your journey, you know? So what I shared on the, the Facebook was that I was thinking about journeys. And one of the things that I was thinking about regarding journey is everyone on this planet is on a journey. And we often think of our journey in kind of a different way. So like when we went to Colorado Springs, we knew when we'd land there, and we drove. We knew when we'd get there. We knew how long we'd stay and when we'd come back, right? We knew the destination, the time frame, and all that kind of stuff. But did you know on this particular journey that I'm talking about, we never know when we reach the final destination, now do we? Then can I ask you as Christians, why are we surprised when someone does? Think about it. And nothing wrong with this in a sense when you think about some of the context, but David Hutchins, 38 years old. In my perspective, he was young. And could almost say, hmm, 
God took him before he could really, he's too young. Not what the scriptures teach. Scriptures teach that every single one of us has a destination, and God's in control of that destination. So as Christians, why would we be surprised? Why would be we be surprised at, at other people's destinations? And least of all, we should be surprised about our own. We're going to die someday. Well, this is. The inside isn't. The soul, the spirit. But this is. We're going to die someday. And we may have our lives mapped out, especially you younger people. When I get out of high school, I'm going to graduate high school, I'm going to go to college. Or when I go to college, I'm going to be a doctor or whatever. And then I'm going to be there eight years. And then after that, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And, you know, if marriage is in the plans, you know, I'm going to get married and we're going to have kids. And then I'm going to go, you know, we're going to have a job, nice job. We're going to have a house. We're going to have the white picket fence. We're going to have 2.3 kids. Uh, we're just going to have a wonderful thing. And then as dads, we can't wait to walk our daughters down the aisle if we have them. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. You know what I'm saying? All, the, all that kind of stuff. But, but do we ever take into perspective the idea that that might not be God's plan for us at all? Because our destination might come the sooner. So what I wrote in Facebook basically was, in order for us, when we forget sometimes to take things on our journeys, may we not forget to take Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one that's going to escort us to our final destination to be with God forever. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jacob's journeys for me has been inspiring, has been incredible. I love going through Jacob's journey. I love talking to you folks about what God's showing me in the Word and, and all these different things. But here's what my challenge is for all of us uh, today. Jacob was alone. I mean, he had his wives, but he was alone. Do you feel alone on your journey? If you do, then may I suggest that you will pray about connecting with somebody in this church to join you on your journey. Because if you're a born-again Christian, you're not alone. Jesus is with you. It should be, you know, he said, I'll be with you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. But if you're alone on your journey, then get a friend. I'll never forget when I was a senior in high school, I was thinking about joining the Marines. And at that point, I don't know if they still do, but at that point they were having this, they had this thing where you can have a buddy system. Where if you had a buddy that from school, you can sign up with him and you guys would go to the same place, do the same stuff, lie, lie, lie. Uh, but, you know, you can, have a, you can have a buddy system, you know what I mean? And so uh, I had thought about going into the, uh, the military. I didn't go to the military. You know, God changed my plans. But nonetheless, a buddy system. And I thought, that is kind of cool because you're going into the unknown and you have a buddy. Can I tell you that tomorrow when you wake up in the morning, I don't care if you're going to a job that you've been going to for years or what you're doing tomorrow, do you know that tomorrow you're walking into the unknown? Because you haven't been there yet. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You really don't. Somebody close to you could have a heart attack or your job could end or something can happen or a friend could call you and need prayer or something. You just never know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's a day that you haven't been experienced in yet. So my, my question is, do you have a buddy in this church? Do you have somebody? Now, I'm not talking about your marriage buddy. Ladies, do you have a buddy in this church? If you don't, may I suggest that you get one? Not for the sake of gossiping or anything, and, and allow them, and, uh, and let them allow you to speak into each other's lives so that you don't have to journey all by yourself and make these decisions all by yourself. Maybe you'll have to, but it's nice. But here's the thing that I can think of. If we didn't have all this stuff that we've read in Genesis about Jacob, what are your thoughts about him? What kind of a man in your mind is he? Would he be somebody that you would consider, up to this point anyway, would he have been somebody that you would consider a godly man? Because remember, Scripture's not quiet about showing his life. What about us? Would you consider each one of us in this place to be godly, mature, 
super Christian. Or do we even know? We're all on this journey together. My encouragement to you is don't go alone. Don't go alone. I mean, apart from you're not alone. If you're born again, Jesus is with you, but you know what I'm saying. Don't go alone. And, and, and try not to do this too much either when you have a buddy. At least till they get to know you. Don't dump everything that you have problems on in their lives right away. Because that's not being a buddy. That's looking for a psychiatrist. Huh? Could you imagine? I mean, I'm friends with the Bundys, right? Could you imagine if I came up to poor Dennis? Hey, man, I just was talking about being a buddy, and I'd like to be your buddy. Are you okay with me being a buddy? And I think he would say, yeah, no problem, because we're buddies already, right? But could you imagine if all of a sudden I make a phone call? Hey, buddy, i got to talk to you. i really got to pull that buddy card on her. And then, you know, two hours later, I'm still even weeping and just sobbing, blah, 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 blah. You know, the next time I call, I can almost wonder, who is it? Oh, is it Kevin? Yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> I know I'm talking to some of you. <laughs> I just do on both ends of the phone. <laughs> I just do. I just do. I'm talking, why don't we start something? Maybe you have a buddy. The next time you call them, don't tell them one problem you have, not one. Tell them everything that Jesus is doing in your life. Man, I picked up the word. He spoke to me. It was marvelous. It was wonderful. This is what God did and is doing in my life. And I just want to rejoice. Can you rejoice with me? Absolutely. Because you know what happens. The next time you call, they'll pick up. Who is it? Oh, it's Kevin. Oh, hey, how's it going? Some of you are like, I can't believe he's talking like this, but I know I'm talking to all of us. <laughs> Amen? And it's not that once you build a relationship, you can't, I need prayer here. We, we, we do need to pray for each other. But let's first establish a relationship. Amen? Hallelujah. And, and then the last thing, and then I'm going to close. With your buddy, maybe your new buddy, are you ready? Let's see you happen to see a sin. Be careful with how you treat that sin. Because the Bible gives us instruction on how to work with people who sin. As a matter of fact, if I remember right, the verse starts off, Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Somebody struggling in sin, you know what they need? An arm. Can I walk with you? Can I pray for you? How can I help you? How can I minister to you? How can I bless you? Not, <laughs> that's three times you sinned this whole month. I'm really concerned. Of, I thought you were more mature than that. Huh, do we need to talk? As a matter of fact, let's go talk to the pastor. <laughs> You're going to be hearing more about this stuff. We need each other. We need to build in each other's lives because if what I feel is going to happen, if what Fillmore and Gina are moving up here because they had dreams and felt was going to happen, when we start seeing new people in here, they need buddies. They need mature buddies. They need people that are not going to be taken under with them, but are going to be strong enough to stand with them and against the stuff that's coming at them in the world. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for Jacob. There's just so much stuff here. Lord, I just pray, Father, that as we're journeying through life, Yeah, we might have times where we slip. The old self might want to resurrect every now and again, and we've got to just put it down. But Lord, if we keep our eyes on you, 
We keep our heart on you. Keep our mind on you. We get a buddy that can help us walk through this journey that we're on. And Lord, maybe when you speak to us and adversity comes, we won't back down and run away and hide. We will press on because we have a word from you that we're going to go forward and we're going to wrestle through in prayer until we are absolutely certain about what you're having us do, where you're having us go, who you're having us minister to or be with. Lord, I just thank you for this group. I pray your blessing on them. May you encourage them this day. And as we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving, I pray, Father, that we would have you on the forefront of our conversation, of our thoughts, and of our lives. I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.